Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware that today's conference is by express written invitation of the AHA only. Anyone that aids and abets unauthorized participants may be subject to criminal and civil penalties under both state and federal law. Please disconnect from the phone line and log off the webinar if the AHA did not expressly invite your participation. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Mr. Jonathan McKinney. Please go ahead, sir. Hello, I'm Jonathan McKinney from the American Hospital Association and the Institute for Diversity and Health Equity. Thank you for joining us today for this timely webinar where we will be discussing the importance of collecting, stratifying, and utilizing race, ethnicity, and language data in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. This webinar will provide a practical example of how real data helps hospitals and health systems to focus on utilizing data to pinpoint healthcare disparities to advance health equity within their organizations. With that, let me introduce you to today's presenters. Dr. Jennifer H. Merez is a leading expert in the fields of nuclear cardiology, cardiovascular disease in women, and patient-centered healthcare advocacy. As Senior Vice President of Northwell Health Center for Equity of Care, Dr. Merez serves as the, as the health system's first chief diversity and inclusion officer. She has oversight of all diversity and health equity initiatives and is a member of the Katz Institute for Women's Health at Northwell Health. Dr. Merez is also the Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs and a professor of cardiology at the Zucker School of Medicine. A graduate of Bennington College and Boston University School of Medicine, she is a fellow of the American Heart Association, the American College of, College of Cardiology, and master of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. She served as the first female president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology in 2009. Our next speaker is Michael Wright. He's currently the vice president of diversity and health equity for Northwell Health System. Dr. Wright joined Northwell Health in August of 2014. He has over 20 years of experience in leadership development and implementation of talent strategies across various industries globally. Michael earned his doctorate in a joint business and organizational learning program with the Wharton School of Business and the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. He also has two master's degrees from the University of Toronto and holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Waterloo. Our next speaker is Elizabeth McCulloch. She's the Assistant Vice President for Diversity and Health Equity at Northwell Health System. Dr. McCulloch oversees system-wide health equity and languages and communication access services and collaborates with multidisciplinary healthcare teams throughout the system to develop, coordinate, and implement standardized effective communication programs, practice delivery models, and performance metrics. In her role, she works to ensure compliance with applicable regulatory laws and requirements related to health literacy, language access, and cultural competency. Dr. McCulloch holds a Bachelor's of Science from Lafayette College in Neuropsychology, a Master's of Science from Hofstra University in Gerontology, and a Doctorate degree in Social Services from Fordham University. Please welcome Dr. Merez, Dr. Wright, and Dr. McCulloch. Uh, Jonathan McKinney for that kind introduction. And I am uh, Dr. Jennifer Merez, and as mentioned, honored to be joined by my colleagues, Drs. Wright and McCulloch today. Thank you to uh, Jonathan McKinney and, and, and uh, Derek for helping us uh, get this webinar started and setting up for this web webinar. What we'd like to do today is share with you how we use a formalized approach to diversity, inclusion, and health equity at Northwell Health, um, how it lays a foundation and using real, real data to help us um, with uh, the onslaught of COVID-19 populations. And you know that we're in New York, 
so we were hit really hard. Um, and so our agenda today will include why we formalize an approach to diversity, inclusion, and health equity at Northwell. We'll discuss our language access services and the focus on real data, which came to light when we signed the American Hospitals Association Equity of Care Pledge. We'll speak a little bit, and, and this will be Liz to talk about our journey to dashboard creation, metric utilization, and stratification. Uh, Dr. Wright will bring us uh, to a discussion on COVID-19 and how Northwell Health played an integral role, partnered with the Governor of New York and the State of New York in helping to uh, you know, bend the curve, so to speak. And we'll discuss real data, COVID-19, on our response to our communities, and then we'll discuss a little bit about our re-entry plan. So as you think of Northwell Health, who are we? We are 23 hospitals, East Coast-based. Most of our hospitals are in Long Island. We have um, four uh, main quaternary hospitals, other community hospitals, over 700 ambulatory practices, and about 70,000 employees. You take a look at our population serve, and you can clearly see that the need for a strategized approach to diversity and health equity is definitely of great importance. And you look at the population served by the Northwell Health um, system, and you see if we were to use language as a surrogate, we serve a population where close to 50% of our population has a preferred language other than English. And this slide shows you the increasing diversity uh, based on race, ethnicity, and language preferred by our population. In 2010, when we formalized our approach to diversity, inclusion, health equity, and established the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Health Literacy at that time, you can see it was coming when there was a national call to action from the Joint Commission as well as the National Prevention Strategy, uh, first published in 2011. And this was based on the fact that as a community, we were dealing with a changing demographic. We had recognized that cultural competence linked to patient safety. And we also recognized that for us at Northwell, if we were to accurately uh, partner with our communities on the journey to health and wellness, we needed a formalized approach to diversity, inclusion, and health literacy, health equity, ultimately. We, over the course of the past 10 years, um, evolved our strategic plan. And in 2017, when we signed the American Hospitals Association Equity of Care Pledge, we evolved our strategic plan into these six pillars that you see here. We, our mission at the Center for Equity of Care was to, is to advance the delivery of culturally inclusive health care and effective communication in partnership with our communities to achieve health equity. We align our health care teams and the communities we serve to address racial, ethnic, sex, and gender disparities, to be a trusted partner by fostering a culture of inclusion, empower all our patients and our communities to be partners in their health, and to ultimately, at Northwell, implement an expanded model of healthcare delivery that includes the components of health literacy, unconscious bias, cultural and linguistic competency. Let's take a quick look at what, you know, at, at some of the pillars and how we're structured, because I think this is important wherever you are on your journey to health equity, and especially having taken, if you've taken the American Hospital Association Equity of Care Pledge, having a platform whereby you can see you have your leadership uh, and a governance structure is definitely important. The leaders, the resources need to be involved. And at Northwell, our CEO chairs our executive council on diversity and health equity, as well as our chief operating officer and our chief financial officer, all intimately involved in the governance and the structure for uh, diversity health equity strategy, including also our chief HR officer. And so you see we report to the Board of Trustees, uh, the Committee on Community Health. We have a uh, diversity and health equity system council, 
we have a council and a committee specifically devoted to the broad uh, global uh, platform of effective communication, which includes language access, which you'll hear from, from Dr. McCullough, as well as we have a physician council on diversity and health equity and a diversity and inclusion workforce council. As you look at our entire strategies and you look at our pillars, you see here we have many strategic partners. And in 2020, we introduced the concept of allyship because we felt that our strategic partners needed to be much more formally aligned as allies in our journey to health equity. And that allyship has come in really handy and been very effective as we battled COVID-19 with our communities. When you look at our training programs available to all employees, we felt that before we could actually um, get the trust of our communities that we, or 70,000 employees, needed to understand the link between health equity, concepts of diversity, tenants of inclusion, and cultural competency, and the link to improved outcome. And that was important in, in building trusted partnerships with our communities. And you can see here that uh, our training programs, we've trained over 18,000 um, of our team members, have been educated in the areas of unconscious bias, language access, health literacy, and cultural competency. You take a look at the partnership with our communities, and you see we have established, and, and you'll hear a lot more about this, um, our faith-based Route clergy roundtable. Um, we have strong affiliations with many of our faith-based communities on our ministers, and they have been instrumental as we battle COVID-19. Our other pillar, um, or employee resource groups, the workforce pillar, where we have strategic partnerships with, our, with members of our HR team and our chief HR officer, and uh, Dr. Joe Muscola and uh, his deputy, Maxine Carrington, you can see here that we have established employee resource groups, or Bridges uh, Employee Resource Group, which have subdivisions of African American, um, Black African American Berg, or Latinx Berg, or Jewish Berg, uh, or Asian Berg, all part of this. We have a Women in Healthcare Employee Resource Group, a Caregiver Employee Resource Group, the Enable um, Berg for people with disabilities, Veterans of Valor, or Lean Berg, uh, Focus on Sustainability, and our Expressions Berg um, to change our healthcare delivery model to be inclusive of, of, of team members and community members who are part of the LGBTQT uh, community. And all Bergs have been instrumental, again, in, in dealing, building the trusted partnerships and helping us um, have access and partnership as we dealt with our communities for COVID-19. And finally, as you look at our supplier diversity um, pillar, we have established a supplier diversity council um, in partnership with many of our women-based and minority-earned suppliers and a strong partnership so that they can see, have access to helping Northwell on the journey to diversity, inclusion, and health equity. And this is just a structure of, of our strategic partnership with many of our outside um, supply diversity groups. We have a supply the diversity council. We partner strategically with the Women's Business Enterprise National Council, as well as with our National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. So this just gives you an idea of our platform or strategic roadmap um, for journey to diversity and health equity. And this foundation has been instrumental uh, in helping us advance the uh, American Hospital Association Equity of Care Pledge. So I will turn you over now to Dr. Liz McCulloch because she will help us recognize what some of our deficits were after we did the AMA CCAT uh, climate survey, recognizing that language services was an area critical to the, the collection of real data, race, ethnicity, and language preferred for us to really be useful um, in helping identify healthcare delivery disparities as well as healthcare disparities. Dr. McCullough. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mraz. It's wonderful to be here. 
with you all today to share our journey. And so I'm so thankful for the opportunity and so thrilled I get to speak about a topic that I'm so personally passionate about. So I will be taking us through a deeper dive specifically on race, ethnicity, and language data and how we got to where we are today. And in doing so, I'd like to share our journey from the start because I really think it might be helpful in understanding that it was, it was and most certainly is a journey and there were many lessons learned along the way. You may notice that I highlight language more than race and ethnicity, and this is because I believe it was the variable that we had the most disparities with and most difficulty with. Um, so to start, as Dr. Merez mentioned, when the Center for Equity of Care was established in 2010, we initially conducted a baseline assessment of a sample of our hospital's readiness to ensure effective communication using the American Medical Association CCAT survey tool. And to our surprise, language access was one of the domains that stood out. Our scores throughout this domain were so low, and our data that we were collecting was so poor that we actually were not even able to measure it or be benchmarked against any other institutions along this language access measure. So these findings really prompted us to take a greater focus on language and truly formalize our approach to understanding who our patients were and how we were meeting their cultural and linguistic needs. Next slide. So therefore, in 2012, language access became centralized under the Center for Equity of Care, and we established a system-wide program with the goal of providing the highest quality of culturally and linguistically appropriate health care for our LEP population. And we did this with conducting a review of our existing policies and procedures and creating a strategic plan with some of the following goals, which was to ensure that we were providing meaningful accommodations to our limited English proficient patients and actually recognizing who those patients were for providing accountability for these services at our, at our individual facilities, establishing an order of when staff should use certain available resources, educating our staff to ensure quality of these services, and of course, documenting and monitoring language services. Next slide. Over the next few years, we started to engage and establish a tremendous amount of diversity and inclusion initiatives. We created comprehensive policies, we educated really anyone and everyone we could touch. Um, but one thing kept falling short. Did we really know our patient population? Our data really was not reflecting what we were seeing in our facilities, what our vendor interpretation usage was telling us, what our communities looked like, and what our staff members were telling us. We knew we were diverse, but our data just wasn't showing us we were diverse. So we soon realized the old saying of you can't manage what you can't measure. So it was really at this inflection point in 2016-2017 that we expanded our goals within the center to have a broader focus on not only health equity, but also fully embed the AHA Equity of Care Pledge into all of our priorities. Next slide, please. So in 2016-2017, we signed the American Hospital Association's Equity of Care Pledge. And as many of you may know, um, this national call to action was launched with the following, to accelerate progress in the following areas. Today I'm gonna to focus specifically on the first one, but the four major priority areas are increasing the collection as well as use of race, ethnicity, and language data, increasing cultural competency training, increasing diversity and governance and leadership, and improving and advancing our community partnership. Next slide, please. So here's where the, the fun and the change really started to happen. This is where we really discovered why our data was not helping us to understand the communities we serve. And it was because we had a big, big problem with not only our data collection, but our data standardization. It was garbage in, garbage out. It was data just to collect data and check a box. It was not really helping us to inform our decision making, our policy development, our community outreach, or customize, helping us to customize our care to our patient population. We first started with our electronic medical re record systems and created strong partnerships with our OCIO team. We're a large system, as many of you may be as well, and across all of our systems existed dozens of different options for collecting race, ethnicity, and language. I'm again gonna focus specifically on language because for us it was where the most disparities existed. So the current EMR systems that we had were not standardized with regards to the collection of this data. I'm just gonna highlight a few examples below. Um, this is an, a snapshot from one of our EMRs where we had 
languages on there that are not even languages. They are countries. Uh, we had languages listed twice. We had um, the ability for our clinicians to select multiple languages. So the patient could be, for instance, both English and Spanish speaking. And we also had a tremendous um, free text field. So we had clinicians entering paragraphs within our free text field that were really not helpful for our data, data standardization purposes. Next slide, please. So this slide shows some of our progress. Immediately upon implementing these changes throughout our EMR systems, we started to see a change, and we started to see some more accurate data being put into our system. So in making these changes, we actually decreased our errors in language documentation to below 5%. And you could see some of these errors documented here that were no longer present are those such as multiple languages being selected, the other field being selected, and uh, long free text being put in there. We also looked at our language discordance. So that means within our EMR system, language is able to be documented within two places, once at registration and once within the patient's profile. And we wanted to ensure that these were being collected the same way at both points of contact. So this uh, decrease in error rate also captures our language discordance. Next slide, please. So now that our data collection systems were standardized and refined, we now began our education. We launched a We Ask Because We Care campaign, which is a national campaign to reduce healthcare disparities and advance diversity and inclusion to support the goals of the AHA pledge. The main goals of this campaign are to improve the accurate patient data collection of race, ethnicity, and preferred language, as well as to educate the communities we serve about the importance of them providing us this data. Next slide, please. We approached our education to this campaign uh, from two angles, both um, our employees or our internal education and our communities, our external education. So for our internal education, we formed a structured curriculum through the use of a mandatory e-learning module that was endorsed by the Joint Commission, and that was required for all frontline registration staff what was, what was so important is we also met with our registrars. We met with our registrars across many of our hospitals and facilities to truly understand from them what issues they were having and how we could help. And nine times out of 10, almost everyone we interviewed stated that they needed scripting on how to handle difficult situations, but these were actually very difficult questions to be asking our patients. For example, a lot of patients would refuse to answer race and ethnicity because they would say, can't you tell by looking at me, or it's illegal for you to ask that question, or I don't want to answer that question. So the registrar really needed some concrete examples of how to respond to these patients and scripting tools. So we created those as well as some quick guides and job aids for them to keep you know, at re readily available. And then for the community education piece, we collaborated with a number of different areas. We collaborated with our community relations department, with certain um, community-based organizations, local government agencies. And the goal of these partnerships were really to engage and inform our community members of why it is so important for them to provide us with this data. So we've really empowered them with the tools and resources that they needed to provide us with this data and education on why they'd be providing it to us. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of some of the resources that we provided to our community members. On the left-hand side here, you see we created I Speak cards, which are uh, wallet-sized cards that our community members could bring with them to our facilities and our top languages that simply tell the registrar the language they speak, that they need an interpreter, and any other information, there, there's a space for information to write on the back. So this was really helpful for our community members, and they really appreciated this because they were able to bypass the, the difficult conversation of getting an interpreter. We also created a flyer, which you see on the right, that details to our community members that when they come to our facilities, they will be asked these three questions. What is your preferred language? What is your race? And what is your ethnicity? We also detailed to them in a very health literate manner the reasons as to why we would be asking them these questions when they came to our facilities. So we also translated this document in the top five languages of our, of our facilities. Next slide, please. So now we really started to have some accurate data that was being collected effectively and efficiently. So we were really excited to now use this data 
to improve the ability of our providers to identify and address health disparities, to look for variations in clinical outcomes, resource utilization, length of stay, frequency of readmissions, and actively use our real data for strategic outreach and planning to inform our community decisions. Next slide, please. So we created a real-time interactive dashboard so that all team members from leadership to frontline leaders could readily, easily, and succinctly view this data. We first looked at our language diversity, and what we did is looked at this variable from three different components. We looked at what our employee data was showing, the languages other than English that our employees spoke, to see how that mirrored our patient population. We looked at what our electronic medical record data was showing us, so our patient overview, and then we looked at how that data compared to what the census was telling us our patient population looked like. And so within each of these variables, we looked at the percent of English-speaking patients, the percent of limited English-proficient patients, the top five languages within each facility that was observed, as well as what this looked like from a zip code component, meaning where were our highest concentrations of limited English-proficient patients and how were they scattered across our demographics. Next slide, please. We then partnered with our leadership and we got feedback that this was great, but there is some dashboard fatigue and that our leaders are seeing dashboards all the time and data all the time. And so they really needed a quick snapshot of what their facility looks like, what the patient population looks like, what their employee population looks like, and what the census data told them they were looking like. So we created more of a summary page for our executive. Uh, next slide, please. So we then expanded this dashboard to include a multitude of other variables that we were also working on refining um, as well, which include not only language, but race, ethnicity. We also looked at gender, age group, discharge disposition. And most excitingly within this, we started to stratify by principal discharge diagnosis so we could start looking at those clinical quality indicators. And what was so great about this dashboard creation was that it was interactive. So once you clicked on any of the variables, so for example, let's say you wanted to look at your Hispanic population for your facility. So if you clicked on Hispanic under the ethnicity box, all the other variables would change as well. So it would show you for the Hispanic population what the principal discharge diagnosis is for that group, where they are commonly located from a zip code demographic standpoint, what their gender was, their age group, their discharge disposition, what languages they spoke, in, they spoke and their race, and of course, volume of patients. So this was really starting to be helpful for us as we stratified our data. Next slide, please. So this is just one example um, of how we use this data to really inform our education. And specifically, this was to inform education for our maternity patients. So as I mentioned, the interactivity of the dashboard, if we clicked on Spanish-speaking patients, which was our top language outside of English, we saw that their most common discharge diagnosis was delivery, whether it be, you know, um, C-section delivery, vaginal delivery, uncomplicated delivery, all of our top discharge diagnoses were related to maternity patients. And at Northwell, we have a, a rather robust education system in place for our maternity patients. They can take CPR courses, baby basics classes, but all these classes were offered in English. So this data really drove us to inform our, our education and community outreach efforts to change and make the change to have all of that education available in Spanish as well. So now, as a result of this data, all of our education classes for our maternity patients are available in Spanish as well. Next slide, please. So then along came COVID, um, a global pandemic that really highlighted disparities in a way that could not more readily underscore the importance of accurate data collection. And at Northwell, as Dr. Mraz mentioned, we got hit very hard. So the processes and protocols and standardizations we had in place from a race, ethnicity, and language data perspective really, really helped us during this difficult time. Um, Dr. Wright will get into this a little bit later on, but we were really able to customize care as best as possible to our patients because we really understood who our patients were from a cultural and linguistic standpoint. Next slide, please. 
And just as a snapshot, just to give everyone an idea, we saw at Northwell, we treated nearly about um, close to 60,000 patients and evaluated hundreds of thousands. Next slide, please. So as our health system responded to the current pandemic, the Center for Equity of Care really formalized our approach to addressing what our new normal was by organizing a series of educational events, virtual workshops, support for our workforce, our patients, and our communities. And we did this with using our data as a foundation to guide many of these deliverables. Next slide, please. We engaged in a number of special assignments outside of caring for patients within our facilities. Um, some of these special assignments included alternate care sites, such as the Java Center and the USNS Comfort, establishing multiple swabbing stations across all of the five boroughs in Westchester and Long Island, and establishing antibody testing partnerships with the FDNY, the MPA, and the NYTD, and a number of faith-based organizations. Next slide, please. In addition to the special assignments, we realized that this was a really unique time for us to understand, to use our data to understand the virus and all its disparities through research. So we established a COVID-19 research consortium that met multiple times a week and was comprised of cross-functional teams to focus on non-interventional research and manuscript publications. And many of the publications that have been informing pub public policy decisions and COVID protocols across the U.S. were really derived using the data we worked so hard to refine to ensure accuracy. Next slide, please. Then comes the data. So this is an example of the data that we used within the research consortium. We sliced and diced the data every which way we could. This displayed here is just dummy data, but we stratified the data for both our patients and our employees because there are communities as well to really further understand the disparities associated with COVID. We stratified them, stratified COVID data by race, ethnicity, preferred language, and in addition to a number of other variables. Next slide. Most interesting, though, was stratifying our COVID data by zip code. This helped us to target our outreach efforts by focusing on and better understanding the zip codes with high concentration of positive COVID cases. Analyzing and viewing this data in this manner really allowed us to physically see where COVID and how COVID has disproportionately affected low-income minority communities, particularly African-American and Latino populations. Next slide, please. So using the zip code analysis to guide our efforts, on May 8th, Northville partnered with Governor Cuomo and the New York State Department of Health to offer free antibody and serology antibody testing in underserved communities to about 25 churches in the five boroughs, Nassau and Westchester counties. So in a very, very short period of time, about a two-week period of time, we assembled a team of individuals to prepare us to test in these churches. And within the two-week period of time, we tested close to 25,000 community members. Next slide, please. So members from our senior leadership team at Northwell visited the site. They met with the faith-based leaders of these organizations. And ambassadors from Northwell Health, including our African American and Latino Business Employee Resource Group, were present during at these testing sites as well. And community education was also provided to those who registered and tested at these churches. And educational brochures were made available in both English and Spanish, outlining what COVID is, how they can protect themselves, antibody testing, and the process for getting their results. So our partnership was met with tremendous enthusiasm from church leaders, so much so that they even printed their own announcements and brochures, which were distributed during virtual services, prayer services, Facebook, Instagram, and other social media um, vehicles that they used to communicate with their constituents. So it was really a wonderful opportunity for us to visit these churches, to provide community education, and begin to establish what we hope will be a long-term relationship with church leaders using our data. Next slide. This is just a, a quick slide just to highlight the um, tremendous media attention from major network social media and news outlets that this work received. Next slide, please. And so lastly, we know that these types of collaboration and work with our churches and their communities is so needed as we continue to receive numerous requests to do testing in these underserved communities. Um, our ultimate and long-term goal is to establish enduring relationships with these community members 
including community education on COVID and other illnesses that disproportionately affect these communities, and continuing to use our data to guide their efforts. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Wright, who will take us through some additional initiatives that our office has worked through during this time. Thank you, Dr. McCullough, and uh, it's an absolute delight to be with everyone today, and thank you again to the AHA for inviting us to be part of uh, this webinar. Uh, this slide highlights a number of activities that our Center for Equity of Care was focused on over the period of March through July. Uh, one of the big efforts that we um, deep dived on was with our community boards, in particular understanding the needs of our community uh, so that we could provide resources and support. Uh, one in particular, I'll highlight our Community Board 13, which is uh, within uh, one of the diverse, uh, most diverse communities of New York, um, uh, raised issues around mental health uh, as folks were going through COVID, but even thinking post-COVID, how we continue to manage uh, those needs. And so we partnered with our behavioral health team to focus on uh, stress first aid. Uh, I can tell you that that uh, workshop uh, has now become a template for deployment across other community boards. Uh, like many of you, uh, language access, uh, telehealth, uh, interpretation services, health literacy, cultural competency, translation of documents was of utmost importance during uh, COVID. And so our office played a huge role ensuring that our providers, uh, our caregivers, had the necessary information they needed to be successful with the patients they were serving from a language access, translation, health literacy, and cultural competency perspective. In addition to uh, all of this work, uh, as Dr. McCullough and Dr. Mirrors mentioned, the amplification of healthcare disparities in communities of color uh, was very evident during COVID, and so it, it raised the need for us to form uh, a health equity strategy and consortium in response to COVID. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in addition to our focus on community, we were also focused internally uh, with our HR partners, our, our leadership teams in supporting redeployment activities, not only uh, during uh, the height of COVID, but through recovery uh, and uh, looking at how we realign people to different uh, talent pools across the organization, uh, but also a, in, a, in a recovery mode, how we supporting um, the revamp of our ambulatory uh, uh, shared services clinical work streams. Uh, additionally, our, our business employee resource groups that Dr. Merez referenced, uh, we retooled that strategy uh, to support during COVID response. Again, purpose of the Bergs was to not only build a pipeline of diverse talent, but build trusted partnerships with the communities we serve. And so, uh, given the community needs, particularly with our faith-based communities that Dr. McCulloch uh, talked about in terms of testing, uh, the Bergs were integral in supporting uh, those efforts. In thinking about the Health Equity Consortium, this group was established to align the data that Dr. McCall was talking about to comprehensively analyze the health disparities and come up with solutions that were going to be equitable in terms of our healthcare delivery response. We were bringing together key strategic partners across the organization to operationalize a phase gate approach to address the complex social determinants of health and broader needs in response to COVID-19. Ultimately, to address community needs, serve as a, as a, as a, a gate for uh, health disparities research proposals through the research consortium, uh, as well as contribute uh, to the research con uh, consortium. And one of the areas that we looked at was health equity, and so our team was uh, instrumental in, in evaluating uh, health equity research proposals coming out of uh, COVID. The key areas of focus of the consortium, education awareness, language and community access, community partnerships, population health research, workforce engagement. And this uh, strategy brings together all of the various community-based partnerships that we have internally as well as externally to address the health equity needs of our community and to help us in a, in a post-COVID environment build that trusted partnership, again, with the communities that we are uh, serving. 
to go back to the pillars uh, that Dr. Merez introduced us to that have been the, the framework for our formalized approach uh, to diversity, inclusion, health equity for the last 10 years, when we look at leadership commitment and the work that we did from a COVID perspective, again, the redeployment activities that were in place, uh, setting up the strategy, uh, the health equity strategy and consortium, as well as playing an active role in the research consortium in terms of the data, research paper contributions, evaluating the health equity uh, papers was a big part of the leadership commitment. When we look at effective communication and education, there were a ton of deliverables in this space, but just to highlight a few, again, um, translation, health literacy, cultural competency to support patient community needs, very critical. You know, standing up some of these uh, remote uh, centers, the Javits Center, uh, the USMS Comfort, providing, um, you know, needs from a translation uh, services perspective there, as well as policy review, uh, were really important uh, in those uh, particular areas. When we look at uh, the next pillar, workforce, again, uh, a number of items uh, put in place in terms of providing resource guides for our team members and for our patients that were translated and available, accessible uh, for people to utilize during, uh, during COVID. Uh, creating infographics, uh, again, uh, designing, redesigning our BERG strategy, our business employee resource strategy to better respond to the health equity needs of our patients and our communities, but not only just supporting the needs of our communities, but also supporting the needs of our team members. And so creating support events, coffee conversations, et cetera, where board members could get together and uh, support each other during what was a very challenging time. And when we look at community partnerships, again, to iterate, having resource guides available, having, um, you know, involvement with community boards. Uh, you know, taking a very active role in uh, supporting our faith-based communities, in particular community-based organizations, very much integral uh, to our community partnerships. And lastly, when we look at our supplier diversity uh, pillar, again, um, you know, we recognize that our suppliers are part of our communities. We wanted to, under, uh, be, you know, wanted to ensure that they were uh, okay and that their needs were being met as well. Uh, so we uh, made sure that we had tracking of our, of our suppliers, diverse suppliers during this period, that we were able to um, assist them from an education perspective as well as uh, ensure that they were aware of the procurement needs that we had uh, so that they could uh, support those needs. And finally, when we look at our Tax Institute for Women's Health, the focus on sex and gender disparities across the organization, uh, being able to make community education available online across a number of uh, 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 topics as well as supporting community partnerships. There's a, a couple here referenced. Uh, we're really integral to the work uh, of the CATS team uh, related to sex and gender disparities. Again, as we went through COVID, we continued to manage uh, this pandemic through simultaneously planning and implementing our health systems uh, recovery effort. And as we went through these different phase gates, we had to look at the elements of diversity, inclusion, and health equity to sure, ensure that these needs were being integrated uh, as we uh, responded uh, to COVID. This last, uh, the last two slides that I'm going to highlight here, um, prior to COVID, uh, and as Dr. Merez mentioned, we, we've been on uh, this journey for the last 10 years in terms of formalizing our approach. Prior to uh, COVID, we recognized that our workforce was changing, and we wanted to get ahead of the curve and understand what the needs were from our workforce perspective relative to diversity, inclusion, and health equity to make sure that the strategy we had in place was, meet, was meeting those needs. And so oh, prior to COVID, we had reached out and dialogued with well over 1,000 team members across the organization to understand their needs, uh, understand what was working, what wasn't working. And and well, as we went through uh, COVID, uh, the strategy that you see here became integral. We needed to continue to stay the course with the strategy uh, as it was uh, an enabler to help us respond effectively to COVID. And as we entered into the next 
pandemic, looking at issues of racial inequity and structural racism in the country, uh, again, uh, in addition to uh, a number of deliverables we put in place from a system response perspective and from a site and service line perspective, we said we need to stay the course on uh, ensuring that we're living into our workforce equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy. And so it's become really a, a grounding uh, element to how we're moving forward, not only in response to COVID, but now in response to this new uh, uh, healthcare inequity uh, racism. And the last slide here I'm going to highlight before I hand it over to Dr. Merez is that as we continue to further our culture of inclusion, focused on the elements or the deliverables of the equity of care pledge, uh, building a diverse pipeline of talent at all levels, building those trusted partnerships with the communities we serve. Again, focusing our uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts on a number of uh, targeted identified groups, uh, really important to our go-forward uh, uh, plan uh, in terms of ensuring that we can sustain our focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, into the future. With that, I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Merez to share a few lessons learned and close us out. Next slide. Um, you know, thank you, uh, Drs. McCullough and Wright. It's truly my honor and privilege to work with you. We're on this journey together. And I hope you have realized, and thank you for the opportunity for us to share our strategy uh, with you. And, and hopefully part of the recognition is that the journey to health equity is like climbing Mount Everest. And you need to have all hands on deck, lots of strategic partners, but importantly, a formalized approach, uh, as we shared with you, really lay the foundation and the framework and got us ready for being able to rapidly understand the needs of our diverse communities when we were hit with COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. I think, as Dr. McCulloch has pointed out, you know, the lessons learned, one important lesson, and this came along when we uh, signed the American Heart Association's Equity of Care Pledge to 16, 2017, that you need to really have a structure in place to collect accurate data on race, ethnicity, and language preferred. And, and Dr. McCullough highlighted, you know, where we were starting from ground zero, or probably from six feet under, as I like to joke. And building a dashboard, understanding our communities definitely was important, and we were able to use that data, um, especially by zip code, to figure out where our patients were coming from, what their language needs were, and quickly adapt to meet those needs. You, you have to have, we understood from going through COVID and for our 10-year journey, the importance of a partnership with your communities, understanding their makeup, understanding what their needs are, and customizing based on, on the needs. Uh, for example, in, in or one of our, our hospitals, uh, Long Island Forest Hill, in, in Queens, the most diverse neighborhood, we now have, um, we know that there are 22 top languages that we have to be ready to, to, to deal with. So a lot of our vital documents now are customized based on the needs of our communities. Uh, as Dr. White pointed out, enhanced, getting the workforce as partners and engaged in fostering an inclusive culture and to be culturally responsive, definitely important. And finally, um, the importance of partnership with our communities on the journey to health and wellness. And so with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you to the uh, American Hospitals Association uh, for giving us this opportunity, and I will turn it back over uh, to Jonathan for, to, to close us out. Any questions, you can refer to Dr. McCullough, and you see her email address on this slide. Thank you. This has been a very insightful and informative webinar session. I would like to thank our presenters today, Dr. Merez, Dr. Wright, and Dr. McCullough. Thank you for sharing your expertise with our audience today. To stay connected and up to date on, on the Institute for Diversity and Health Equity's latest reports and webinars, please follow us on Twitter. We would also like to ask our viewing audience to take a moment to complete our webinar evaluation form. 
You will see a link on your screen. However, to access the survey, please use the link located in the webinar description on the YouTube channel. You can also find a link to the survey on the description of this webinar on the Institute for Diversity and Health Equity webinar website. We hope that you take this opportunity to evaluate this webinar and help us understand what is working well and what is most beneficial to you. Thank you so much, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.